Okay, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, join each other once again in prayer? Um, there's, uh, I just wanted to make a note of the uh, I uh, issue of the, the readings. Oh, yeah, everybody turn your cell phone off. I think I just heard one. So I've got, oh, do I have mine off? That's a great question. I've actually had my cell phone go off after I made a big speech about turning your cell phones off. Very, very embarrassing. So, yeah, turn your cell phone off if you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, oh, I just please ask you to do it in your pants. Um, no, we're not judgmental here. So um, and save yourself some, uh, some trouble. Uh, and uh, there you go. The, one of the readings, um, are we still having trouble? Uh, the Judith Stacy reading um, technically is in a format that some people had trouble getting. Is, has anyone um, continuously tried and yet has been unable to open it up on their computer? One. More? Two. Okay, I have two people here. Um, you, you need counseling. Uh, no. Um, you've tried and you just can't do it. Um, oh, but uh, I was told last time, yes, yes, uh, there's a PDF. So if you just uh, go to Google, yeah, and type in Judith Stacy and the title of the article, it'll just just appear magically uh, out of the uh, uh, Stratus world thing. So uh, there we go. So we get to talk about, was there another question or murmur to be shared? No. Um, we're going to talk about race uh, today, R-A-C-E. Uh, and um, I just, in, in, in case I fail to ever mention it, um, uh, sociologists regard race as a, as a fiction, uh, as do, um, um, I think, most other types of scholars, uh, that it really doesn't have any uh, utility um, as an objective thing in the world, but it has plenty of utility as a sociological thing in the world. And so that's what we're going to do, is unpeel that sociological utility by answering that question of what is, a, what is race uh, and what is a race. Now we're going to be uh, talking about some of the readings that I haven't had a chance to talk much about, um, especially over the next session and the sessions after that, um, and particularly the Denier book and um, uh, some of the readings under race uh, uh, for today um, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, myth, the myth of race uh, as, uh, as it's, uh, and the myth of ethnicity, the ethnic myth that is also on the reading list. So don't give up. Uh, we're going to be uh, returning to those uh, readings. But what can we do now? What can we talk about now, given the topics and the readings that I do want to talk about? Well, um, race is, in a way, not like sexuality, and it is like sexuality. It's uh, the more interesting thing, I think, is to talk about the ways in which um, it, it is not. So sexuality uh, is presumed to come in two varieties. And there is this uh, vast amount of ink spilled um, on uh, and effort in the world to boil it all down to two kinds of things, males and females. And biologically, there's a lot to support that. That is, it's obviously not a kind of out of thin air kind of distinction to make. Um, and uh, we know that uh, one, with one sexuality, you can reproduce, for example. And there's been no way to found yet, at least, for a male to reproduce. And that's a big thing, uh, the capacity to reproduce. And there are other physiological differences as well. So although I was pressing very hard the idea of trying to see the fuzziness of that boundary between male and female, uh, something I still stick with, um, it's, uh, it's quite plausible, isn't it? because there are very strong physiological differences going on in the world uh, between something that we tend to call male and something we tend to call f uh, female. But with race, uh, that doesn't really work nearly as well, uh, because um, there is a kind of rainbow of physicality. There are, uh, there are gradations of physical difference that uh, we see all around the world. So people don't come in uh, two types, black and white, 
or five types or seven types or 11 types, but is obvious to our naked eye, certainly here in New York, given the vast migrations uh, that we've achieved over the last, um, well, 150 years, uh, it, it's obvious that there are shades of people, uh, shades um, in terms of skin tone, but also the other markers of race. Um, eye shape, nose shape, uh, hair, hair consistency, and all the rest of the, the things that are um, used as markers of what a different race could be. So the people who want to make a harsh distinction, a strong distinction, a clear distinction between races with clear definitions of what they are have really a bigger challenge uh, than they do with, say, sexuality. But that doesn't mean they don't try. Uh, and indeed, this gives us another way of, uh, of going at that same question again, that what is it that uh, people do with what do they make of things that have physical difference uh, and how do they uh, reinforce, um, reinterpret, and make those count in the world in very, very strong ways, regardless of the degree to which that's backed up by anything really significant in terms of a physiological, uh, in terms of a physiological underpinnings. So, we're dealing with a world not of ducks and bunnies uh, or males and females. Uh, we're dealing with uh, what we now, in contemporary social science language, often describe as hybridity. Uh, we're all hybrids. We're all mutts. Uh, we're all from different um, strains of what it means to be a human being. At one point, uh, that obviously was not the, the recognized difference. Um, and we have a constantly changing orientation toward race among those who are looking for clear differences. So in the United States, for example, um, uh, peop the Irish were actually considered a race, and the word race was used. And there are drawings um, as part of the anti-Irish sentiment at the turn of the uh, prior century that show uh, Irish people physically drawn to look like monkeys as a way of explaining why it is that the Irish had such low intelligence and low capacities uh, for understanding how these natives think differently than other kinds of people. And there was a kind of physiology that was drawn in to make them different. Jews were considered a different race. I think uh, they're a little bit behind the Irish in terms of completely shedding that. Uh, but on the whole, Jews have become white um, and joined the white race but they've joined the white race through a kind of historic process of redefinition. And Asians are our newest white people uh, who are, I think, becoming white uh, under our very eyes um, at, this moment, uh, at this moment in history. And of course, that wasn't always so. They have been restricted in severe ways uh, earlier in American history. Um, in California, not uh, allowed to own property, for example. Um, and have the property that they uh, did own confiscated and, of course, uh, put into internment camps uh, during World War II. So we have made much of these uh, variations, and those variations uh, shift, uh, shift over history. But what we're always doing is magnifying, reifying, stereotyping, um, and making something of it uh, that, um, uh, that we in a way, have a choice about, and that is not built into the phenomenon. And again, I'll remind you, again, going back to the duck-bunny discussion, that stereotyping is always a part of human cognition. So what, what's happened in the case of race, um, and what happens in the case of sex and gender, is that this built-in tendency that is inescapable, which is that we want clarifications, we want clear objects, we want unambiguous situations, gets applied to one thing and not another thing, and the content gets filled in in one way as opposed to another. So getting back to ducks and bunnies, um, we want to see it as one or the other, but there's no pejorative about duck or bunny. That is, we're not making any judgment that ducks are really smart um, and bunnies are really stupid or vice versa. It's just a distinction that we make. But often the distinction is not just made, but then is ranked. There is then a hierarchy of content 
of what goes with each. And of course, now we get back to uh, the idea of race um, and has it's been um, worked over the years in order to make these distinctions and make them invidious dis distinctions, not separate but equal, separate but unequal, with different kinds of stereotypes being laid on to particular, to particular groups. So one of the ways of explaining all of this, and it's, I think, only uh, a partial explanation, is that um, people who are in positions of power and capacity redefine the other, uh, that group which they are exploiting and dominating, as essentially different. And that uh, word essential is used a lot in social science uh, as well as in literature these days that is trying to say that men are essentially different than women, like they can do science better, uh, that um, natives are essentially different uh, than um, ex explorers or those who make contact with them from the outside or modern peoples, that they think differently, that there is an essential difference. And so uh, there has been a kind of effort um, over history to establish essential differences uh, among those in power compared to those who are not. Now, I just should caution you that it is not always about, say, color. Um, we know that if uh, I often ask uh, taxi drivers um, in the world when I travel, uh, when they tell me where they're from, and they're often from a different place than where uh, the cab ride is taking place, uh, I ask them about uh, the, uh, the, their people compared to other people. And of course, what's quite remarkable over history is the way the Swedes um, hated the Norwegians and the um, um, the, the so Croats and the Serbs, that there is, uh, within, and of course within Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, a tremendous uh, orientation of, of conflict, of repression and suppression of people who are, to our eyes, of really quite precisely the same uh, physiological qualities. But the stereotypes of, well, they're lazy, you can't trust them, um, and so forth and so on, are, um, are very close to the surface. And uh, one finds them all over the world in all sorts of ways. In the history of our people, the United States um, and our British forebears, uh, there was a need to justify the exploitation of people of color um, and uh, compared to the people who were doing the exploiting of the, of the people of color. And I'm speaking of, of course, the colonial moment. Um, what was Captain Cook doing there anyway uh, in Hawaii? And um, when, we're, when I was in high school, at least, I was taught that it was about great imagination of the great explorers. They had courage. Uh, they wanted to know. They wanted to fill in the mysteries of the world. And of course, they were looking for gold. They were looking for riches. These were career-building moves on the part of these people who did it. Um, and if they live through it, high-risk job, uh, they um, um, indeed become um, the great, great people of their era, great men of, of their time. But of course, you all know the story, uh, there was um, a consequence to be paid by those who uh, came in contact with them. Uh, the Hawaiian people, to just continue that example, were virtually completely destroyed. Um, a little piece of data that we do have is that in the what is now the state of California at the time in 1800 before the uh, conquest of the Indians got really going by the Yankees, there were 300,000 um, Native Americans uh, in what became the state of Hawaii um, in, in 1800. By 1900, 100 years later, there were 15,000 uh, Native Americans in the state of California. And it was not through intermarriage that their numbers were so reduced, because indeed the amount of intermarriage uh, or intermating, unlike, say, the US South between the plantation owners and the black slaves, was much, much less. And uh, the way that story is told of the destruction of the um, Native Americans in California, and by extension to other places, is that it's not due to just one thing. It's due to many things. It's due to violence. It's due to depriving people of their livelihoods. Um, it's due to, of course, microbes uh, for which they are, uh, don't have resistance to. But it's not due to one thing, and it 
happen sequentially. So what we know from the demographers, demographers are people who study populations, and um, demography is really, it's kind of a branch of sociology, usually housed within sociology departments. We know from the demographers that when populations are, um, um, have severe losses, uh, for example, due to disease, they, you, you see that severe population decline in a single generation, but then in the next generation, it comes roaring back. And so after the Black Plague, for example, the population of Europe reestablished re itself in only, over the course of only a few generations. Uh, birth rates increase, livelihood, uh, length of life increases, more people are alive to reproduce. And that is what, um, that's what happens. But with the Native American population, and by extension subjugated peoples who are subjugated in that way, there is no chance for revival. Because just as um, you survive um, uh, uh, one kind of um, uh, catastrophe, uh, boom, along comes another kind of catastrophe. So that the smaller number of people are reduced to a still smaller number of people and reduced to a still smaller number of people. And that continues over time um, in a way that is uh, perhaps justified in calling genocide. So no one um, at a given moment uh, wanted to kill all the Indians of California, uh, but it didn't take very long uh, before that became the result uh, by depriving people of the capacity to, to be alive um, in one um, way or another. Well, anyway, this kind of damage is known to you and was known to the people to some degree who were doing it. Uh, but they uh, had rash what we would today call rationalizations for it. There was much argument in the United States as to whether or not uh, Indian people, Native American people, um, and then African American people had souls. If you don't have a soul in a Christian environment, then it means that all the rules are off in terms of whether or not they should be subjugated appropriately or not, um, or indeed the value of their lives. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, uh, read you some things that were said um, in the 19th century um, in the United States, uh, written about uh, these subjugated people uh, as ways of justifying the kind of terror um, as well, which in the form of lynching, of course, in the U.S. South, um, and the general deprivation of African Americans in this country. I think I once mentioned that the by far greatest bulk of our scholarship on race in the U.S. is, uh, is on the subject of black and white um, and those differences, something that, of course, uh, is not consistent with the fact that our, uh, our, the, quote, racial cont content of our people um, is far more varied than that um, and has all kinds of shades, um, as well as the strong presence of, of different groups from different parts of the world. But uh, the black-white uh, difference is one that is very important in our history. And it's important. Uh, one way of talking about the, the importance of the black-white divide in the United States um, is to speak of America not as a country which had slaves, but rather to speak of the United States as a slave society. And not just the South, but the United States and um, indeed much of what we today would call the Western world. So much of it was organized around the fact of slavery, so that the textile mills of the Northeast were fed by cotton, which is produced uh, very, by very cheap labor in the U.S. South. Um, but, um, that's where the raw material comes from, and that's made possible by slavery, and then after Reconstruction and the end of slavery, by, um, in effect, indentured servants who uh, work the land at um, very, very, uh, at very low wages um, and at bare subsistence. So um, uh, that the great fortunes, including great fortunes uh, that are all around us, the founding of Brown University was a slave family, the Browns, um, uh, that uh, uh, as high as 20% of the population of New York City were themselves slaves um, who were um, brought here uh, from the South or directly deposited as part of the slave trade. So um, to say that the U.S. 
uh, had slaves is to miss the boat. Um, like ancient Greece, uh, which was also a slave society, the U.S. was a slave society. So you needed quite a bit of uh, intellectual armament, I think, to uh, protect that idea um, and to make, it, uh, to make it plausible. So anyway, here is, I'm going to read some things that are painful to hear, and especially for the African-American students in the class. I've made the decision that it's worth it in the end um, and uh, for us all to be um, exposed. So here in 1866, 1866 um, is a Northern American named George Fitzhugh, um, who was a prominent uh, American politician as well as quasi-intellectual. And he wrote, wrote they, this is about um, Negro orphans and what to do with them. Uh, they, the Negro orphans, lost nothing in losing their parents but lost everything in losing their masters. Negroes possess much amiableness of feeling, but not the least steady permanent affection. Out of sight, out of mind is true for them all. They never grieve 24 hours for the death of parents, wives, husbands, or children. So that's a severe a set of notions of how natives think that's different from other people as I think um, I could get. It continues on, they are elevated from the condition in which God first created them by being made our slaves. Slavery then was uh, beneficial um, and it created the most cheerful and merry people we have among us. Now here is a, a, a founder of American social science and sociology in particular, a professor at Columbia University um, writing in 1910. Um, and uh, this was his doctoral degree at Columbia um, in 1910. For those of you interested in these things, his name was Howard Odom, O-D-U-M, and he was part of a distinguished um, series of intellectuals who came after him, maybe who came before him, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know about who came before him. Anyway, he wrote this in his effort to um, understand uh, the Negro. The Negro has little, which was the one of the main purposes of his dissertation. The Negro has little home conscience or love of home, no local attachments of the better sort. He has no pride of ancestry and he is not influenced by the lives of great men. He has little conception of the meaning of virtue, truth, honor, manhood, integrity. He does not know the value of his word or the meaning of words in general. They sneer at the idea of work. Their moral natures are miserably perverted. So um, that's, what, um, uh, that's what you can get from um, a sophisticated view at the time. And I read those indeed. Um, they're a small sampling. I have even um, a much larger sampling, including I have a little sampling of what Californians in particular said about um, uh, Mexicans, uh, people with Spanish surnames, how, de how they would degrade the future of America and degrade the future of California. Not as bad as that, uh, but right up there. And for um, immigrants from China and Japan, a similar lack of warmth um, in the greetings that, um, that uh, people um, responded to them with. Well, I talked about the indigenous Americans and how they faced one sort of catastrophe after another that so caused their numbers to dwindle. In the case of African Americans, there's a mixed history in terms of the demography. Uh, and uh, as we know, however, um, uh, enormous numbers did survive physically, in part because unlike the uh, Native Americans, their labor was systematically required to work the system and work the economy. And so it was critical that they be kept alive, at least at the level of subsistence, and indeed to have some level of physical capacity and strength in order to reproduce and create other valuable slaves, as well as to uh, be able to um, uh, uh, work, work the fields. Well, um, after slavery, um, I alluded to that stage a little while ago, a few moments ago, after slavery, uh, there was a new kind of uh, a set of, of, of textures, you all know this very well, in the period of Reconstruction. Uh, the African-American slaves did not get their 40 acres and a mule um, as they'd been promised, but they indeed had other challenges uh, which they had to deal with. 
um, the poll tax, the inability to uh, deprived of the vote, um, deprived of work except in the most uh, base um, kinds of circumstances, and also, of course, uh, the horror of lynching. Um, this is a song I'm going to play for you from Billie Holiday, uh, and um, it's called Strange Fruit, and some of you uh, may know it. I have the lyrics here, but I think that she um, is clear enough that I don't need to read them. Uh, Billie Holiday uh, it was, uh, during her not very long life, uh, one of the great singers of, uh, of America, uh, and every, all jazz aficionados um, know and respect, revere might even be the right term, Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday, however, could not be played on the radio in the United States, except on what were called the race stations, which only evolved themselves later on. Um, and so, in a way, although we are left with um, some works by Billie Holiday, we're not left by all that much. And she had a tougher life than uh, she otherwise would have had, I think, or certainly a different life, if she had been um, uh, allowed to pursue her career. Southern trees, that strange fruit, blood on the leaves, and blood at the root, black bodies swinging. In the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. So, um, so, uh, I went through this, um, including the quotes that I read. People have sometimes, years ago, used to ask me, uh, what did I think uh, went wrong uh, in race relations in America? What was the source of all the problems? And I said, well, I thought that slavery was getting off to a very bad start. And I think that um, in terms of the depth of the issue, um, and its capacity to um, continue on to affect uh, the country and affect our lives, that that um, d really doesn't, is not a mystery. Um, and it might make some sense when looked at in terms of the actual history uh, that uh, doesn't go away. Uh, I'm going to talk later on about how, to some degree, it indeed does go away. Um, and that's the, um, that's the good news. And um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to have some happier news uh, than I've been able to give you uh, than I was than I than I just gave you uh, just now. Well, anyway, um, I mentioned some of the challenges uh, of um, to African American society um, even after the Civil War and indeed after the lynching terror um, had um, ended or been curtailed. Um, as uh, jobs opened up in the industrial north, they were of only limited uh, openings for African Americans, so they were deprived of participation um, in large measure. And it was not just due to the capitalist pigs, but also due to the unions themselves, which uh, kept um, uh, people of color out um, on a systematic basis. That still continues, by the way, in some occupations and in some uh, segments of the of the labor movement, although obviously much much less uh, than it used to be. And after World War II, uh, the next great migration of African Americans was to the north from the south, which was actually greater in number than the migration of African Americans from Africa uh, to the United States. Uh, so large was that migration, which then changed the nature of American cities in the north as well as the south and created new kinds of issues of, for example, segregation, job segregation with African Americans getting the lowest jobs, uh, residential segregation, which is something that is very much on the mind of William Wilson, uh, who you're reading, and how that then, um, how that evolved. 
However, it, it evolved through systematic efforts, um, syst systematic moves by the government that affected African Americans in very detrimental ways uh, compared to other Americans, compared to white Americans. So, for example, the federal government after World War II established, um, beginning in 1949, uh, that which, the famous Housing Act of 1949, uh, created um, massive subsidies of suburban development, a way for people to get loans at very, very low cost, um, uh, and many people did, combined with um, uh, benefits of the Veterans Administration uh, for home loans uh, for people to get their mortgages. Uh, combined with other mechanisms, this opened up the suburbs uh, on a vast scale to uh, Americans after World War II. I come from such an environment. Um, my parents had houses and all of that um, it, because of FHA, the Federal Housing Authority loans, which um, built suburbia, uh, almost quite literally built suburbia. Those loans were not made available to African Americans. And they were not made available because of the following reason. If you're going to make a loan, or at least this was said to be the reason, if you're going to make a loan uh, out to somebody, uh, you want to make sure that it's a good loan, that you'll be paid back. And if it's a house that you're loaning money on, then you want to make sure that the house will hold its value, since if you've got to, for some reason, um, uh, take it back, if the borrower defaults on the loan, then, then you, the, lo the lender, in this case the government, which guarantees the loans, that's a, a very important part of the process, that you, the government, will have to take it back and you will lose money. It was believed in those days that racial mixing caused property values to decline. So now we have a new sort of theory of race. It's not just that blacks are different from whites, and that is a kind of thing of their skin color, that it makes them different in the way they think, the way they act, what kind of jobs they can do, and all the rest of it. But something kind of magical happens if you combine them together. And what happens is if you put them in the same pot, then, i.e., the same neighborhood, then property values will fall. The only way, the only way to stop that from happening is to consider them high risk in the first place and not loan to them in the first place. This is what the policy was, and it's in writing. This is not some kind of uh, paranoid interpretation of what they were doing. This is in writing. This is what they did. And we use the term, by the way, institutional racism, which we'll talk more about later on, to describe this process of what happens when uh, a group is being deprived not because of a prejudiced person who says, no, you're, as the slogan was, if you're black, get back. The rest of the slogan is, if you're brown, no. If you're black, get back. If you're brown, stick around, I think. Uh, I'll get the lyric for you uh, another time. Um, uh, and if you're white, you're right. Something like that. I just may have just made it up. I'm, we we're all rappers, you know. Uh, it's the best I can do. Um, so uh, that's institutional racism. That you you don't then have to have anybody saying no, we don't give money to blacks, or I don't like you because you're black. It's not about prejudice. Rather, you've set up a system that automatically deprives people uh, who happen to be black, as we say happened to be black, and to whatever degree prejudice was involved earlier, and that's even open to debate. I just gave you a kind of business model of why you wouldn't allow blacks to have these loans. Uh, it, it just makes sense to do it that way, and so whoever was bigoted at the beginning of the whole thing, they could be long dead and gone. The system goes on and continues to deliver those results uh, just as though um, just as though they were um, still alive. So there were other things too, like redlining, which is a famous thing that urban people, urban studies people know about, where whole neighborhoods are blocked off from being eligible for loans, and the banks just draw a red line around areas of the city where no loans will be made. Those, you guessed it, uh, would have been um, black neighborhoods. 
Um, and, so, um, and so it goes on, um, one after the other. So severe is this process uh, that there is a famous book in sociology uh, that, written about it that is called American Apartheid, that in effect you get the kind of result that you had in South Africa, but you got it through these subtle institutional mechanisms uh, that I've been talking about and some not so subtle that I was talking about earlier, that is hatred and violence, uh, and you create a black America and a white America. Some people think that that's exaggerated, um, um, and certainly compared to South Africa and what was going on, it is indeed um, of a different quality, much less intense. But, uh, but there it is, uh, and it has some, um, some sticking qualities as we labeling theorists uh, might want to say. Now one of the realms um, which I really uh, like to turn to because I think it's so clear is what happened to black Americans and white Americans in terms of entertainment. Because even in this um, uh, ultra racist uh, language uh, that I read about, read you, uh, there's still this idea that there are merry people uh, and that's been a theme of the stereotype of African Americans, uh, the most cheerful and merry people we have among us. And this cheerful, merry people um, means they're good entertainers. And so there has been a tradition of blacks being entertainers uh, for, for the white race. There's also, of course, the tradition of minstrelism in which white people even get the jobs of the entertainers but paint themselves up as black people and exaggerate the, the, the traits that are said to be true of black people um, in order to be entertaining. And so minstrelism is, and the minstrel is a branch in a way of black entertainment, uh, but, in, in the, but performed, performed by whites. Well, in this realm where um, people do indeed say that there is extraordinary talent um, in the black communities, um, um, in jazz, uh, rock and roll, the history of dance, uh, these realms, we nevertheless still see a kind of discriminatory pattern. And when I played Billie Holiday, I mentioned that Billie Holiday, who also sang, she, didn't, she wasn't only a political singer, in fact she overwhelmingly is not a political singer, she's a blues singer, she sings about love, the man who left me, all that kind of stuff that uh, people uh, enjoy uh, being miserable about uh, in their lives and listening to. Um, Billie Holiday um, was massively discriminated against. That would be an understatement um, of, of how it worked. And in some cases, uh, the song written and performed originally by a uh, black entertainer would then, be, um, would then be made by a white entertainer, and the white person's song version, the cover that the white did, would be the one that became the big hit. Now, I'm going to play you uh, an example of that. Um, and in this case, it's uh, Fats Domino. Does everybody know Fats Domino in the class? If you don't know about Fats Domino, raise your hand. OK, you don't know about Fats Domino. Uh, if there's one thing good that's happened to you this semester is that you have heard now about Fats Domino. Um, and he's a, a very important person in the history of rock and roll uh, and American music. Uh, and I know the answer to this one. Who in the room has heard of, of uh, Pat Boone? Raise your hand. We got a sprinkle, more than a sprinkle. I won't call on you, I swear. Uh, just in, in the back and then um, somebody in the front who's having trouble with opening the files. Uh, some people know about it seems like I need this vote again. Uh, I want to see, uh, first we're going to do the Fats Domino question, OK? And I want everyone to participate. Uh, raise your hand if you have heard of Fats Domino. OK, now put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have heard of Pat Boone. Raise your hand. It's pretty close, but Fats Domino won. Um, and I'm happy about that. And let's, uh, but let's not take my word for it. Let's see what they can do. You made me cry when you said goodbye. Is that a shame? 
to back, okay? Uh, and I want you to tell me who do you think is the better singer, okay? First of all, I'd like to see the hands of the people who thought that Fats Domino was the better performer. Raise your hand. Okay, uh, for thank you. For the people of the rest of the world, that was the vast majority. Uh, I won't embarrass the uh, uh, three people. Uh, <laughs> did, did you feel different about this? You go with Fats? Yeah, so that um, makes it, I think, 100%. Uh, and the reason why I did this, uh, first of all, those of you who don't know about Fats Domino, you, you can see what's going on. And um, he had people literally dancing in the aisles. I'm always worried. Uh, actually, when I taught in California, I once did have people dancing in the aisles. Uh, but that was, a, that was then, uh, and this is now. And... Um, uh, um, but it, it is Pat Boone who had the major career uh, compared to Fats Domino. Uh, it's Pat Boone who made the money uh, compared to Fats Domino, including uh, working, on, uh, working on the songs. So I use this because this is an uncontested realm. Uh, it's an uncontested realm. And it shows you the way in which the institutional racism worked that black people were, you could not even hear them on the radio. The stations would not play the music. Um, and thus, there was no way that they could become popular. And of course, that all changed starting in the, uh, especially in the 60s, 1960s. First, though, the first stage was particular radio stations for blacks um, where, the, where the music would be played. For it to cross over um, into the white world was a big deal. Um, and that um, came eventually. Uh, but it's a whole lot of fortunes that were never built um, because of the, uh, of, the way, of the way it worked. So um, that's why I use that example, because I think it's so indisputable as to where the talent was, and we have a clear understanding of how it worked. Well, uh, now let's talk a little bit about consequences. Uh, and the fact that this is the way, this is the, way the world worked. Um, and uh, the stories, uh, e even if they weren't this harsh, the stereotypes that I began with uh, are still alive in the land. They're being transmuted and turned into uh, institutional practices, um, as I just told you about, with things like the FHA loan structure, which then creates the great suburban boom in the United States and the segregation of black people from, from white people and how that all worked. Uh, another consequence, though, is the consciousness uh, that this all has on white people and the consciousness it has, in particular, on black people. The consciousness uh, that it has on white people, if everyone you know who is white is living in a suburban house uh, with a lawn and a particular way of being, then it must be that race has something to do with decency and a decent way of life. It becomes another kind of structurating process. It's another way in which racial the racial divide is structured into society as people live their lives, uh, as it enters their consciousness from, quote, all the evidence around them uh, that uh, there is this racial difference, in this case, in how people live and how you can see them living one group um, in a pristine, uh, lawn-filled, um, uh, modern environment, uh, and another group in the inner city in a slum-like condition, which we need to do something about in order to change uh, their way of being and their way of life. There are consequences then also on the African-American community. There are, for example, material consequences, like the following. 
black people don't make as much money as white people. They still don't make as much money as white people. But traditionally, over this era, the post-war, uh, late post-war era, the late 20th century, um, black people's income is approximately two-thirds that of whites. So there's a significant difference in wages, um, and a which means a significant difference in income. Though um, male-female difference is something on, the, on the roughly the same magnitude as well. So uh, black people... The guy who did the best he can of... Oops. Um, uh, what's his name? Oops. Everybody was covered. You know, there was oh. a black artist, and then there was a white artist who covered it. And that time, the top ten I stations. Gotta get, I got to get closer to this thing. Okay. Uh, so there are uh, um, uh, clear differences that are being um, made manifest. Uh, one, one of them is in, in m income. Black people are not getting as good jobs as white people, and so their income is roughly two-thirds in, in the late 20th century of what white people earn. But um, what we know is that there is a much greater difference in wealth. So I want to make this distinction between wealth on the one hand and income on the other. Wealth consists of stocks, bonds, and real estate. For most Americans, the great bulk of their wealth is not in stocks and bonds, although it is if, if you're old enough in your retirement fund, you sometimes build up a goodly sum in stocks and bonds indirectly through your retirement fund. But the income that you can get your hands on, the resources, shouldn't say income, the resources you can get your hands on are in your real estate. And that then is used for different purposes. First of all, it gives you stability. So if you're hit by one of these catastrophes, a personal catastrophe like unemployment or severe illness that removes a breadwinner from the family or engulfs you in medical expenses, you can do something about it because at worst you can at least sell your house or you can refinance it if you've had it a while and raise capital. If you or one of your children wants to start a business, you can get a second mortgage or you can even sell your house if you feel strongly enough and in that way raise capital. If you don't have the capital in real estate and it's overwhelmingly your own house, that's the, the way it works in the United States, then you don't have those opportunities. When you look at all the wealth that people have in this country, and I'm using data now from the late 20th century, uh, what you find is that black income is 67% of white income, but black wealth is the ratio is one to seven. White people have seven times the amount of wealth that, white, that black people have. And that statistic um, was worked out by one of our colleagues here at NYU named Dalton Conley, who is a sociologist who is now the dean of the social sciences here on our campus. And this was his uh, PhD dissertation. Um, and it has indeed been um, an amazing factoid uh, and an enduring uh, thing for us to know. So it means, therefore, that when we try to explain white differences and black differences in outcomes, that is, who starts the most businesses, who sends their children to college the most, whatever thing you're looking at, um, we have always underestimated the degree to which there were financial differences between blacks and whites that explain it, because we didn't take into account the difference between black wealth and white wealth, which are so uh, skewed um, in the white direction, much more skewed uh, than, than is, the, um, income, is the income variation. So what does this then, let's look for more consequences um, in terms of blacks and whites um, and how they uh, live and how they carry, carry on their existence. I think I mentioned to you in the context of the Milgram experiment that there are variations uh, that have been staged in which the supposed victim is not a white person, as you saw in the movie, but is a black person. And what we learn is, is that that is one of the conditions that causes the amount of shocking to go up. We know that in battle, for example, in the war in Vietnam, the people who were sent in the most dangerous conditions and who died at a higher rate were black people uh, compared to, to white people. Uh, there are um, then, um, uh, oh, here's one. This is just uh, 
wow of a shocker um, to me, and that is that when uh, when people have um, when people are getting medical care uh, and um, are likely to lose a limb um, in in the case of uh, what's the disease that I just forgot the name the sh with sugar diabetes right thank you when you uh, have diabetes and um, uh, and sometimes a limb has to be removed. Uh, it, it's, it's learned that blacks lose limbs at 3.6 times the rate that whites lose lower limbs. This is only about lower limbs. Uh, extraordinary outcome. And even when uh, both the blacks and whites have the same health insurance, the same policies, white people hold their limbs. It's not that great a ratio but hold their limbs more than, than black people. Uh, and how, how can we possibly explain that, especially the, the ones with the insurance issue? Well, it's a little like the shocking issue um, in the Milgram experiment. We, uh, we, it is already being said, there's now uh, quite a bit of writ written about this, and this is another useful factoid for you to have as you go through your life, that uh, doctors will work a little harder for people they like compared to patients that they don't quite like. It's a very subtle process. You read about it, actually, um, on Dead on Arrival and the way in which a homeless alcoholic at the emergency room is more likely to be considered dead under the same medical conditions compared to a hale and hearty um, uh, person uh, who is not in those conditions, is not a returning uh, drunk uh, constantly, uh, will be considered more uh, alive than um, uh, someone who is um, indeed in that kind of continuous uh, dire strait. And so, therefore, uh, you want to be on the right side of your doctor. Um, you should uh, be fresh as a daisy uh, when you go in uh, and uh, be nice. And that's one of the reasons why also we don't interrupt the doctors when they're talking to us because maintain, and we're in a dilemma, aren't we, that we want to maintain their pleasant affections at the same time that we have questions that we want to ask, like, um, and here's a start, is it really necessary to take off my leg? Uh, and uh, that is a question that, again, the uh, African American students will want to put forward with um, more energy, probably, um, than the white students in the room. And it's a way in which there is still, uh, speaking of late 20th century, uh, there is still significance to race. I just use that phrase, significance to race, because William Wilson, who you're reading, who's a sociologist at Harvard and is, by the way, an African-American scholar himself, he wrote a book called The Declining Significance of Race. And the point of his book is to say that, wait a minute, all these things may have been true, the kinds of things I've been reading about and talking about, um, uh, today, but this is all in the decline. And indeed, we have many surveys that show that white people's prejudice toward black people is in the decline. Um, and therefore, and William Wilson argues this in the piece that you're reading, we need to direct our attention to policies um, and situations that may be a kind of leftover of racist periods, but which are uh, not continuing because race is so significant um, in American life and in American attitudes. And so therefore, he says, we need to, for example, um, be able to move black Americans into the suburbs where they'll have access to the jobs that they're otherwise excluded from. We need full employment programs for everybody. Um, and then black Americans will get a piece of that action as well. And if we do that, we have our best shot because of the fact that otherwise things are pretty well under control. Well, that's why uh, an article uh, uh, that you're reading by Diva Pager, P-A-G-E-R, who's on your reading list, who's a professor of sociology at Princeton, accounts uh, for so much. What D Diva Pager has essentially done is created an experimental situation, or an, what we call an audit, a racial audit, A-U-D-I-T, like in accounting in which you simulate a black person applying and a white person applying for the same thing and we'll see who gets it. 
And um, we've done this, we sociologists have done this in, across the board in many things. Uh, somebody wants to rent an apartment, you send a black family, uh, they're turned down. Immediately after, you send a white family, exactly matched. Uh, you know, 1.3 children, 1.3 children, uh, BA from NYU, BA from NYU, everything is the same. Um, and then you see, and you, you guessed it, that the white family gets, gets, the, the, gets the place and the black family does not get the place. Uh, to a degree, all of these are tendencies. Over time, these tend to be uh, declining. Uh, and indeed, William Wilson's comment, his phrase, the declining significance of race, makes some sense um, in that regard. However, Diva Pager found some massive differences in employment potential and the capacity of people to get jobs. Uh, and the most striking single thing, and what you realize you read, what she did, uh, which is that she created, matched people, a black man and a white man. They both go out to get a, a lower ranked job. This is not to become a, a, a bank president or a surgeon, but an ordinary working class job. A black person and a white person both go out to get the job, and we see who gets the jobs. And what we learn is that, first of all, having a prison record of any kind is a real detriment to get a job, whether you're white or whether you're black. And with our massive labeling system that we've talked about in America and the, this, the, the, the creation of what is now the, the, the largest rate of incarceration, the highest rate of incarceration in the world, we now have millions of people who are stigmatized by having been in prison. But if you're black, you got double stigma. Uh, you're stigmatized because you've been in prison if you're identified as having been in prison, but you're also stigmatized if you're black. And the major finding uh, from her study is that a white uh, man with a felony conviction and having served in prison for a felony conviction uh, gets a better response from employers than a black person with no prison record whatsoever. That is a kind of stunning uh, kind of finding that is contemporary. Uh, Diva Pager did this work, well, probably about 10 years ago now, but it's uh, by the time we get around to doing our work and writing it up and all of that, this is considered uh, the most up-to-date kind of data that we have. So it means then that um, to say that there may be declining significance of race um, and our, uh, the, the race of our president of this country is, of course, such a striking um, uh, phenomenon that it certainly has declined uh, as significant, but it uh, still then, um, it's still around. And then there are a series of consequences that I haven't talked about um, among African Americans uh, that need to be talked about. So you read about the double consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois talked about. Well, there still needs to be a double consciousness. And um, I know from my African-American friends that it still goes on. One, ver one, uh, one aspect is that you have to be ready for what one of them calls the nigger moment, that the vast majority of people, that he's a professor uh, at Yale University, that uh, the vast majority of people he comes into contact with uh, are what he calls the good whites, um, and he can make his life with no trouble. But then every once in a while, that's not true, and he's got to deal with it. Um, here's something that, uh, let's see if I can find, um, uh, yikes, yikes, yikes. Um, I don't know what I did with it. Um, a quote from um, President, Clin President Clinton, from uh, President Obama, in which um, President Obama uh, uh, was interviewed uh, uh, shortly before, in the year before he became President of the United States, and they asked him, the interview asked him whether or not uh, race still matters uh, in America, and uh, did it make any difference that he was African American. And he said, uh, I can tell you that um, the moment I walk out of this interview, um, it's, there, it's there with me. Um, and he is just an African-American man. There's another um, example of, um, of another African-American friend, and this is much repeated now um, around uh, 
around circles is that uh, the way to hire, oh, and President Obama referred to him catching a taxi. That is, when he goes to get a taxi, he is an African-American man. And one way in which you can hail a taxi if you're an African-American man um, is to, of course, be dressed uh, in a particular way uh, and also flag the taxi with a Wall Street Journal. Hold out the Wall Street Journal and flag the taxi that way. So this is a kind of double consciousness. Another thing I hear from my African-American friends is that when they walk into a room, they're immediately aware of who is African-American in the room and who is not. It's like an immediate piece of data uh, that comes to them. And maybe the white students in the room have the same, uh, 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 the same capacity, uh, but um, with less um, probably uh, persistence and overwhelming uh, need to do so. In, your, uh, in, in William Wilson's piece, you read about the fact that one of the other consequences is the ways in which um, um, people of the different races um, can, uh, uh, re regard things that are going on in society and, and what they make of it. So I want to give you a piece of, of survey data that was done, um, published in a book in 2002. So it's a little bit old, but um, not too old. William Wilson refers to the fact that uh, when O.J. Simpson was found not guilty, uh, there was rejoicing in the black community and that large percentages of the black community thought that O.J. Simpson was indeed innocent and that he was framed by white police. Whereas among whites, me included, the vast majority uh, thought that O.J. Simpson was obviously guilty um, and there was nothing, nothing to that at all. So let me give you some other kinds of uh, survey data on black-white differences in what they uh, think is going on. Um, nearly half uh, the, of, of blacks um, agreed with the statement that, quote, the FBI and CIA make sure there is a steady supply of guns and drugs in the inner city. 28% uh, of blacks agreed with the statement that, quote, white doctors created the AIDS virus in a laboratory and released it into black neighborhoods, close quote, in the, in the survey item. So um, I think that uh, to everyone in this room, that does not Neither of those uh, pieces of information sound right, but, uh, but large numbers of people in the black community do, read, do believe them. Um, almost no one in the white community believes those things. And that starts signaling the dif differences that still persist um, in the modern moment between white consciousness uh, and black consciousness and the way they make sense of the world. Um, maybe uh, being a little paranoia paranoid makes um, uh, some sense when uh, we get this other kind of information that I've actually been streaming toward you, including who loses limbs uh, and who doesn't lose limbs. And there are many other examples I could give you from the history of medicine, uh, for example, of how this uh, racial divide has operated and may indeed be uh, creating different circumstances. Let's just talk for another few seconds about this um, thing my friend called the nigger moment um, and how it works. Um, you know about Professor Gates at Harvard who was coming home from one of, our most, one of the most very famous academics we have in the United States um, and was coming to his home, returning home from a trip to Asia. Um, you all know he's on the subways and everything, Gates now, right? Because he's got this show about the, um, do you all know about Gates? Everybody does, yeah? Okay. Um, very, very famous a celebrity academic, uh, if there um, is one. Um, and uh, the police thought he was breaking into his own house in Cambridge uh, when he was coming home. And, um, a, a, and he then faced his moment uh, where it didn't matter that he was a famous professor um, standing in front of his own house. He's also, by the way, crippled. He's small. Uh, he's, he's about my age. Uh, I'm not taken as a threat to society. Uh, I think I could break into anything and not get arrested. Uh, and yet uh, Gates um, is uh, picked up standing there um, uh, trying to get into his or seen uh, approaching his own house with a, with a, a cab driver and uh, luggage. Uh, and yet um, he, gets, uh, he gets picked off. So.
Um, it's, um, we're not there yet. I guess that's what, um, what I'm trying to get at uh, with all of this, is that uh, these moments um, indeed uh, come about. So we can see that uh, although there is a declining significance of race, um, and I could have just buried you in data, that would give you a much happier uh, view of things to say that since uh, Billie Holiday's time, uh, there has been improvement um, uh, really uh, across the board, but still there are separations. And that one of the consequences is this double consciousness that, um, that we've been talking about in the, all, at various points in the semester. And, um, and that brings up Joe Fagan's article, Joseph Fagan, who wrote the, this piece on middle class African Americans and the fact that they don't know. And, and, and that's the critical thing about the double consciousness. If you, we've all had the experience of going into a restaurant, uh, the tables in front of us get served before we do, or the people who are in the, in the hallway who came in later than we did get a table before we do. They were a table of four, we're a table of four. How come? What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? Well, we do that. We white people do that. We middle class and upper middle class white people do that. Well, just lay on all of these, all this other stuff of, about race. And of course, you're going to be engaged in that kind of judgment uh, and worry and wonder as part of your double consciousness. And it's going to be that sometimes you are wrong, as sometimes I've been wrong. What's going on here? They got the table before I got here, blah, blah, blah. and then I learned actually they were in the other part of the restaurant. They were here earlier. I didn't know. Oh, gee, oh, well, oh, well. Uh, so it is uh, with anybody in that circumstance. And the degree to which you're primed for it, and what I've tried to do today is show that virtually all of history has primed people for it, it means that difference is created. And so now we're back to where we started when, uh, when, we, uh, when the lights went on and when we first started talking about all of this today. And that is that what we have are differences in phenotype, as we like to say, in physical um, look and appearance uh, that is actually remarkably subtle. Uh, there are some differences in physiology that the geneticists are able to point to that are incredibly subtle. But so much has been made of them in this long historical process of, in effect, of constructing the very idea of race um, as essential differences among human beings, and then filling in the content of what that distinction consists of. And after it's all been done, and we now live in it, um, it's something that continues on as a factor and as a force um, in American life, as it does in other parts of the world in various ways uh, that we're not taking up. But there is another world out there as well. So that's it. Uh, close your books. We're done. <laughs>